Okay, Marshall University, Fall 2018, uh, Social Psychology. This is the rest of what we didn't cover in the first PowerPoint last week. Um, we had some really good class discussion. I felt it went really well, um, and I appreciate your all's stories and how you shared um, um, a lot about your personal lives and your experiences. Um, that was really, really great. I didn't want to step on that, so... Uh, I'm going to finish up. I think there's like 16 or 17 slides left. You have the note-taking part for this if you want to pull it up and fill it in. We'll, we'll go ahead and finish this part up here uh, so we don't have to finish it in class so we can talk about um, dreams and some other exciting stuff tonight. Now, we finished class last week talking about attitudes, about abortion, about homosexuality. Uh, very good class discussion. Um, we didn't really get to persuasion. The process where one or more people attempt to alter the attitudes of one or more people. Um, you can probably think of attitudes that you've held even strongly about various topics. You thought maybe you would never change your mind, but somewhere along the way you have an experience, and actually some of you shared this in class, where something happens, comes along, something religious, a, a person in your life, or just personal growth, and you actually start to change your mind or change your attitude about things. So what persuades us to change our mind about things? Well, here's what we know. Here's what the research says. Experts, or even just perceived experts, who talk to us or try to persuade us to think differently about something have a, a greater than average chance of doing so. Even if you dress someone up who is not a doctor in a lab coat and put a stethoscope around him or her and have him or her try to tell you that you need a procedure that you really don't need, you're likely to believe this physician because he or she looks the part. Um, obviously, we know that attractive sources are more persuasive. Society sets the standard for what is attractive, obviously. Um, the media, advertising agencies have been doing this for, for generations. Uh, distractions, if I can distract you to try to get you to change your mind about something or to persuade you to think a certain way, then I've got a better chance of actually getting you to change your mind. Uh, car salesmen, politicians do this, talk really fast. They'll speed through something. And you'll kind of give people the benefit of the doubt if you can't keep up with them. Also a two-sided approach. This is, abs um, this is actually one of the, the better ways to persuade people. If you guys have an opinion, let's say everybody in the class is for the idea of not having a final exam. Sorry to burst your bubble, we will have one. But let's just say you're all's opinion, the opinion of the class is that you do not want a final. So my job is to come in and convince you that you should have a final exam. So I could do one of two things. I could come in and get your attitude about the final exam and say, well, you know what? You guys are wrong. You're stupid. What do you know? My way is the right way. We're going to have an exam, and here's why. Now, that's not going to be very persuasive. I'm not going to get you to change your mind about how you feel about taking a final exam. However, if I come into class and I gauge the room and you guys say to me collectively, you know, we don't really want to have a final. We don't really believe it's necessary. I could validate your side. I could validate your opinion and say something along the lines of, yeah, I see where you're coming from. I understand your opinion. You know, I give it credit. However, here's my side and here's what I think. I'm much more likely to persuade you if I adopt, or rather if I validate your, your opinion but then present mine. And last but not least, unfortunately, fear tactics. Fear tactics work. Probably the most effective agent of persuasion that we can that we can find. We don't have to look very far to see how this works in the world of politics. Politicians constantly play on fear tactics to convince people or persuade people to think a certain way. Um, now, social categorization. This refers to our tendency to divide the world, the social world, into two groups: us and them. Us versus them. We do it all the time. Uh, teachers versus students. Management versus workers. Uh, Red Sox versus Yankees. Um, Buffalo Bills versus the Jets. <laughs> um, whatever, if my, my one student is paying attention to that. Um, whatever the case may be. And we tend to think that our group is a little bit better than the others. I remember being a student in college, in graduate school, and we would all think, goodness gracious, teachers, they just don't understand they don't understand how busy we are. They just keep piling on this work, and they really don't care. Teachers may conversely get together and think, hey, man, students, they just don't want to do their work. They're just lazy. Yeah, I know they work hard, but they just, it's just not, you know, they're just not performing. Hypothetically, of course. 
having some fun with that. And we, we do these kinds of things, management versus workers. Um, as, as children, we, we tend to kind of get with our friends and our buddies and you know, complain about our parents and how strict they are and what they will or won't let us do. Um, so you get the idea. So we, we categorize this way. Now, it's possible to redraw these lines. This is called social recategorization, a process for reducing prejudice because there is inherent prejudice involved when we socially categorize, when we do the us versus them. So we can recategorize and redraw the lines, therefore reducing discrimination. Um, I can give you a great example. Uh, how many of you have worked somewhere as an entry-level employee, complain about the management, and then one day all of a sudden you are now promoted to management? Do you think differently about the people that you're working with in management now? perhaps. As children, you thought a certain way about your parents. Some of you are now parents yourselves. Do you now think a little bit differently about other parents? Maybe give them the benefit of the doubt because you are now a parent? Perhaps. So we can redraw these lines. Um, an example that I, that I always talk about is uh, Little League Baseball. We had six teams when I played Little League Baseball. We all knew each other. We all went to the same schools. So, I mean, we weren't strangers. However, when we played against each other, you know, we hated each other, right? Like, we were, we were the best team, and the other teams just, you know, they weren't that good. And, and there was constantly bickering and fighting, trash talking. You know how things kind of work in, in youth sports. Unfortunately, that was part of what was happening. And I remember, you know, kids getting into fist fights over things that happened in baseball games. Now, this interesting phenomenon happened. At the end of the season, there's this phenomenon.